Destiny 2 is one of my favorite games. You could probably call it an obsession because of how much I play it. It's the game that my dad and I get on every week to chat. I see. I really did enjoy that that ridiculous Neil Blomkamp thing you showed me the other day. <laughs> Oats? Rocket is yeah. hilarious. <laughs> it's the game that one of my friend groups and my dad get together to raid in. That was way easier than... <laughs> did you hear more. that sound? And it's been a big part of my life since moving away from university. I actually love it so much that I have two raid rings. The first says on its inside, we walk to the end of the world and beyond. I saved up money from art commissions to get it to commemorate both how my Destiny 2 clanmates got me through the start of the pandemic, but also because last year was when I first came out to my immediate family and those friends. As I put it at the time, this year I feel like I walked to the end of my world and I threw myself into the beyond and my friends and close family accepted and supported me coming out as non-binary and helped me to walk beyond. This silly chunk of silver represents the best aspects of a difficult time. Did we get it? Oh, did we get it? Please let me... Please tell us we yes! got it! Yes! We got it! We got it! We got it! We got it! Woo! The second ring says on the inside, Guardians make their own fate. And as a trans non-binary person, that resonated with my soul. The world tried to tell me what my fate should be, and I made my own. This franchise, in a funny way, is heavily interconnected with my journey of self-understanding and my relationship to queerness. Which is fitting, because Destiny 2 is filled with queerness. You could even say that... Something special brought us together. They called it the Traveler. Some quick context for non-Destiny players. Guardians are what the player characters are. They're basically liches, resurrected by slivers of a magic light ball called the Traveler. These slivers are called ghosts, who each have their own personality. A guardian can only truly die if their ghost dies. They are called guardians because they protect the last city, the final bastion of humanity. As well, a lot of the stories we'll discuss are tragic, because the setting is about fighting for hope in a dying, grim future. The golden age is long behind us, the darkness has come, and humanity holds on by scraps. Together, we can take back our home, our light, our hope, or we die trying. Let's start with everyone's favorite gay dads to all player guardians, Saint-14 and Osiris. Back in November of 2020, developer Robert Brooks took to Twitter saying, Representation matters, whether it's sexual orientation, race, culture, it helps you identify with yourself, understand yourself, and feel seen. Queer baiting exists, it's not kind, and it has no place in a queer-friendly community or within spaces that promote LGBT rights. I've been writing Saint and Osiris as gay since I started working at Bungie because that's who they were before. They are private and nuanced characters. There was never a space in which to unequivocally state their identities, but nuance is lost in an age of queerbaiting. So yes, Saint and Osiris are gay. Always have been. You can make the meme yourselves. This put into explicit terms what everyone paying attention already knew. They're the Guardian's adoptive gay dads. I am so proud of every fire team I see climb those stairs. I will hold back tears. It is okay. Listen to him. He's a proud dad. Also, he just wants a hug from us. Come hug! No hug? Okay. okay. We will get there. Osiris is one of the oldest, most skilled warlocks. Trained by the Iron Lords Felwinter and Nerwin, he was the vanguard commander for a time. He's played by Oded Fair, who you may recognize as Ardith Bay in the 1999 Mummy. Osiris's theories were considered borderline blasphemous, and he was diverting attention away from protecting the city to search for places like the Vault of Glass, and studying the Hive extensively, prophesying Oryx, and coming too close to understanding the Vex. For his obsession with the darkness and misuse of resources, the Speaker, the leader of the last city at the time, and Bill Nighy in a mask, exiled him. He left the city willingly and entrusted the Warlock Vanguard position to his student, Ikora. I was going to say student, but... Well, that word is too small for you now. He was off doing research on various things for a long period of time before the events of the Red War, where he sent us, the Guardian, his regards to the AI failsafe. Hello, Captain. This was a tease for the first expansion focused on him, where we helped him fight the Vex in the Infinite Forest. Basically, the Vex are evil milk that inhabit robot shells. Think of them as hardware to your software. They fuck with time to determine the best outcome for themselves and then try to bring about that future. This is why you never drink the forbidden spicy milk. And Kabir said, How about I do anyway? And became a shield. 
The Vex convert planets into mechanical constructs. After a bunch of other story happens and the Guardian helping Osiris with various threats within the forest, we found a very old vanguard signal emanating from the past. We would discover that a long time before, Saint-14 had entered the forest in search of his boyfriend to try to change his mind about pursuing the knowledge about the darkness, and had gotten lost in time, missing ever since. Eventually, we killed a big milky boy and found Saint's body surrounded by thousands of dead Vex in a last resting place. Osiris was distraught for it was his running from Saint that had eventually led to him being lost in time. I allowed him to walk into the infinite forest, and I made certain he would never find me. And I believed there would be a time when with cooler tempers, we could reconcile. I allowed myself to grow distracted, and soon I had lost sight of him entirely. When I realized Saint had vanished, I sent my projections out to every corner of the forest, but it was not enough. All that suffering is mine to bear. But he didn't give up hope. He devised a risky, dangerous, and potentially catastrophic for the entire universe plan. With the help of his ghost Sagira and my boy Drifter, Hey Guardian, attack and dethrone God for me, would you? They built the Sundial, a device to go back and change history. But Osiris' solo efforts were in vain, and he deactivated the dial. Later, the Cabal, that's this group of Rhino-Roman Centurion aliens, tried to change history so they didn't lose the Red War, which was when this Rhino man chained the light ball and kicked us off a cliff and we had to regain our connection to the light and beat him up. Also, he killed Bill Nighy. Osiris recruited us and we went through the time stream, stopping the Cabal and searching for Saint-14. At this point, Saint-14 was legendary in the Loren world. Known to all players, he was the Scourge of Elixni, hero of the Battle of Six Fronts, one of the first Guardians ever. The first Titan Vanguard, and way back when, was inspired by a strange Guardian to fight to make the last city a reality when he was given a glimpse of the future. That strange Guardian would turn out to be us. This is the last safe city of humanity. Hundreds of years from now, during the day, there are children laughing in the streets. He would take the hope from that day into the Battle of Six Fronts, where the city nearly fell were it not for the efforts of specific guardians, Osiris and Saint-14 in particular. Osiris was devastated by all of the casualties, but Saint comforted him as best he could. When Osiris would go missing in his search to understand the Vex, Saint vowed to find him, and we're now caught back up. In the Infinite Forest, we learned when Saint died. We used the Sundial to get to the right time and saved him, later opening a portal that he returned through while headbutting a Minotaur, which is a medium-sized milky boy. We had succeeded in reuniting Saint-14 and Osiris. What I love about this entire story is that they never need to explicitly say, this is a romance. Osiris and Saint-14 just are in love. They even use pet names for each other. I couldn't find the voice lines, but Saint calls Osiris his phoenix, and the lore book The Pigeon and the Phoenix is named for them. As well, other characters have commented on this. Well, call me old-fashioned, but if I broke time to save my knight in shining armor, I'd want him to stop fooling around and climb my tower. Drifter really said, Hey, why aren't they banging? <laughs> <laughs> Their story is in some ways a play on the Orpheus and Eurydice tale. Both of them go into a metaphorical hell to try and retrieve their love and fail. They get to play the exact same sort of roles we normally see hetero couples take on. In a cathartic twist, we as a participant in the story get to disrupt the tragedy and interfere. In a world where queer romances are often tragic, the developers let us turn tragedy to victory. We rewrote history. I mean, it's a love so strong that Osiris risked the whole of time and space just to get his boyfriend back. That's gorgeous. Also, they bicker like an old married couple and it's really cute. Get off this line, Osiris. I'm showing the Guardian something very important. Make me. <laughs> <laughs> you would not survive that, but you made me laugh. You can stay. And we have many instances of their care for each other and the hope they bring to each other. The night you rescued Saint-14, I let a candle to commemorate his return. I watched that candle flicker and burn away as I drafted into sleep. When I dreamt, it was not of the darkness that was left, but of a flame that would not snuff out. Each night that flame burns brighter in my dreams. Each night the dark recedes, if ever so slightly. I do not wish to lose him again. Not now that there is time for something more. 
We're actually in an arc right now where Saint is trying to save Osiris after he went missing and was impersonated by Savathun. Osiris, you must come home. You can still be forgiven. Be careful. I'll hold, hold you, you to it. it. Where is Osiris? Once again, placing their relationship at the emotional core of current events. Just listen to Saint calling out for his phoenix. Osiris, I will not abandon you. I am searching for you. No amount of hive spawn or Sabathun's trickery will stand between us. Wait for me, as I did for you. Entire storylines have been dedicated to their relationship and us bringing them together. It's the most prominent romance in the entire game. The light lives in all places. Most other romance occurs in the lore, which you have to go looking for, and even there, the most prominent romances are extremely queer. For example, the tragic tale of Warlock, Ariana III, and Titan Wei Ning. When they met, Wei asked her many questions that would normally annoy Ariana, but because it was Wei, they didn't. Ariana said of her first meeting with Wei, But that night, because it was you, I knew then and there that I never wanted to be without you. Ariana later made Wei a new titan mark and asked her to join her fire team. Wei said she would follow Ariana to the ends of the galaxy. After time and adventures together, Wei would lose her life heroically fighting the Hive Prince Crota in the Great Disaster, where the Guardians failed to retake the moon from the Hive. Think Yurks mixed with Spider-Man symbiotes? Ariana would go into deep mourning for a time, going back to the bar where they met and lamenting the loss of Wei's laughter. Ariana would join an attempt at vengeance at the Hive, losing her light to the death song of Ir Uet. If this story sounds somewhat familiar, I think it's a retelling of Patrocles and Achilles. Achilles and Patrocles were in a deep and intimate love. When Patrocles was slain fighting while Achilles was not there, Achilles, after a period of mourning, entered a vengeance-fueled rage from the loss of the one he loved most, and he would eventually die fighting the same enemy that killed his love. Here we have queer historical figures as influences on the queer stories found within Destiny. Another prominent romance in the lore is between Anna Bray and Cameron de Muzi. Cameron met Anna while she was searching for information about her past, before her resurrection, and information about the warmind Rasputin. He's a big angry Russian AI who runs defensive installations around the system. Anyway, they fell in love throughout their adventures to learn about the warmind, but Cameron would be injured and placed in stasis to heal within a vault on Earth in the Cosmodrome. My hope is that her recovery will occur sometime soon and that we'll get to see her and Anna interact. This one doesn't draw from ancient literature, but instead draws elements from a modern classic, the Emmy award-winning Heart of Ice episode from Batman the Animated Series, where Mr. Freeze's wife is in cryogenic stasis and he seeks to try and save her. There's also the Queen of the Reef, Mara Sov, who's had relationships with men and women, notably having a friends with benefits relationship with Shax. What I mean to say, is that her brother was a goon. But she was once my crimson bond. Mara also had a romance with Shur Ido, the first Queen's Wrath. Shur had agreed to kill Mara Sov for the Queen of the Awoken, Alice Lee. But when Shur encountered Mara, she found Mara too beautiful to dare kill and instead challenged her most beloved companion to a fight to the death. So, Mara's emo brother Aldrin and Shur competed in three battles, and when Aldrin was successful, Shur placed her life in Mara's hands. They would fall in love, and after exiting the pocket universe of the Distributory and various other events, they would eventually drift apart, remaining close friends and allies as Shur acted as Mara's bodyguard until her death in the Reef Wars. You can find a hundred TikToks by lesbians making jokes about being friends with their exes if you look. It's a very queer story. Destiny is not often explicit about relationships, it never feels the need to spell it out. It treats the audience as intelligent enough to understand when something is a romance, and they never try to use it as an advertising gimmick, but instead it's an extremely natural part of the world. You can walk up to Devrim K on the EDZ and I'll mention his partner Mark, or read that Mark and him adopted Hawthorne when she lost her parents in lore. My dear Mark, I am toasty warm, I assure you. Though, uh, you might send me more tea. <laughs> Destiny 2 highlights so many queer romances, but it's not the only queerness. The man you used to be. I'm not him. There is an obvious trans metaphor in some of the Guardian experiences. It's not perfect, 
but I'm going to use Aldrin and Crow as an example. When a person is revived, they cast off their past life and become something new, changed. In the case of Crow, he gave himself that name. As well, he was rejected by society for what he was before. In universe, it's because Aldrin murdered Cade, but feelings-wise, it's about being viewed as something that you're not. His experience of rejection and marginalization is relatable, and his story is about not being defined by something he no longer is, despite what other people view him as. He is constantly trying to show people that he's not what they think he is. But Destiny doesn't stop at trans metaphor. You can scroll through a lore tab and find out that the Taken King, Oryx, is a trans man. Oryx, who I'll not be dead naming in the discussion of his past, was one of the three children born to the Osmium King on the gas giant Fundament. This was before their race became the Hive. His father had grown ill in his old age and was betrayed by Tax, the sibling's teacher who made a deal with the Helium Court. During the invasion, Oryx and his sisters escaped on a ship and vowed revenge. They eventually went deep within the oceans and encountered the Worm Gods, whose power comes from the darkness itself. They made a pact for immortality and power and the ability to shape their bodies as they wish, in return becoming hosts for the Worm's larva, with the cost that they must never betray their natures or the Worms would consume them. Oryx was told, You may never cease to explore and inquire. Which, curiosity and self-exploration is a deeply trans experience. Upon gaining the powers of the worm, Oryx immediately took on the name Aurix and transformed into a male, the King of the Hive. Which magic transition powers sound great, even if they come from evil worm gods. Aurix and his sisters took over their planet, forming the Hive proper and then spreading out across the universe doing battle with various groups, feeding their worms as they want. Later, when Aurix defeated his Hive god and learned the true nature of the Deep, Commuting directly with it, he became the Taken King, Oryx. He had various children, including Crota. When Crota was slain by our guardian, Oryx came to Sol to seek revenge, and we killed him in the material plane and then again in his throne world, permanently defeating him. I don't care that Oryx is evil. Being a giant darkness-powered eldritch being of death is iconic. Speaking of trans characters, Micah 10 was a trans woman who transitioned when she became an exo. Basically think androids imprinted with a person's mind. She was raised by her gay dads, Hector and Wesley, who worked for Clovis Bray. Think Tony Stark, but actually acknowledged as the evil billionaire? When she was a kid, she collected penguin stuffies and named them after important figures of the Golden Age, which can be found throughout Europa. At some point, she transitioned and got converted into an Exo, likely because Clovis Bray wanted to cover certain things up, as he also converted Hector and Wesley, because Clovis is an asshole. Micah 10 would become a protector of guardianless ghosts, helping them discover their guardian, and a scout of the old Cosmodrome. She even found Andal Brask, who would later become the Hunter Vanguard, preceding Cade 6 in the role. At one point, she formed a group of hunters to protect the town of Coyote from Elixni. These six hunters would become the legendary six coyotes, protectors of refugees and skilled scouts. I kind of love that even villains in this universe respect transness, and that Clovis just helped Micah be who she wanted to be in her exo form. I might be wiping people's memories for my goal of making an android army, but misgendering's not allowed. It's just kind of hilarious. Anyway, as a trans femme exo hunter main, I love Micah. Our universe is a beautiful, terrible place. Part of why I like these stories is that they actually explore the relationships and personalities of the characters rather than hyper-focusing on a non-queer perspective written by non-queer people where the characters don't get to be characters, but just get to be the queer one. Instead, they're queer stories written by queer writers, like Robert Brooks, the narrative designer who I mentioned earlier, and written for a queer audience. As a side note, when asking for examples of token queer characters, almost every response I got was about Bioware, which is, uh, telling. This is not the point of the video, but Bioware, fix your shit. Hayley Abrams, Director of Scientific Research on EOS. What brought you out here to Andromeda? People knew me as Stefan, but that was never who I was. Hello, I'm trans. This is my dead name is terrible writing. Anyway, there are many minor characters mentioned to be trans and non-binary and queer in general throughout Destiny lore. Queerness is everywhere, and it never needs to scream to be seen. It just lets you find it, because it's so ever-present. Constant small little moments of joy for a queer audience to feel seen. And overall, more prominent than non-queer relationships. Bungie staff members also will not stand for people trying to 
They were roommates. Queer characters. See this exchange on Twitter from September for just one example of this occurring. Queerness is baked into the DNA of destiny and reflected in a fan base that in my experience has a lot of queer people. It follows in the footsteps of the long history of online multiplayer games connecting queer people with community and with themselves. See this video by Transparency, who are one of the best video essay channels in existence, for more. Destiny is a world where queerness is treated as so natural and normal that no one has to come out. The queerness is never remarked upon with shock or surprise. And it's a future where hope comes from love of all kinds. Crimson Days. We use these holidays to honor friendship, camaraderie, love. I also think it at least plays some part in the community in my experience being extremely queer friendly and supportive. It's not how I want all representation to be, but it's a form we rarely get. One where queer stories are given equal prominence while never really writing for a non-queer audience. The series is just a big comfort for me. A place of community, and I think its casual queerness contributes to it being a comfort over the last couple years. Rereading all of these stories over the weekend was a nice look back at that. Queerness is about pushing against Allosis heteronormativity. It's not gay as in happy, but queer as in fuck you. I think Destiny does something important in its representation. It presents a future where queerness is such a natural part of existence that queerphobia is such a distant memory no one knows about it. I think it's important for us to have queer art that addresses our current situation in transgressive ways, but I think it's also important for us to have queer art that is aspirational. No character is ever shocked or surprised by queerness in Destiny, because there's no presumption of allosis heteronormativity here. If anything, unless stated otherwise, it's a safer bet to presume characters are queer. Which is why I do have a problem with it. You can still only play as a man or a woman. The existence of people like me is not shown. In case anyone from Bungie ever sees this, I would love it if you'd let us have some more control over the character's model, or at least an option to have gender-neutral pronouns used in voice lines, regardless of which body type we chose at character creation, and also maybe let us swap which body model we use when we want to. As a non-binary person, I would like to see my community represented in your vision of the future, too. The last couple of weeks have been rough, as a trans person, especially as I was releasing a video essay that was partially about my own experiences with the very violence called for by the people cited by the BBC in their hate speech about my community. Go watch this video from Jesse Gender and the pieces it cites if you want to know more. Just before I recorded this, I spent the latter half of the day playing games, including Destiny, with my Lidless Eye clanmates. The handful of people who have been uh, super, super horny for the priest character, they concern me. Well, you can make a remake of the song, hot for teacher, but hot for preacher. <laughs> and it really reminded me why I wrote the script, because afterwards I felt much better. We're social beings and we need connection in whatever way works for us personally. What anti-queer hate groups like TERFs want is to make us feel isolated and alone and less than human. During the pandemic, it's been easier to do that, and as silly as it may sound, Destiny 2 and other games have been a vehicle for getting to have that connection I need. If you're feeling the darkness right now, turn off Twitter, get off YouTube, find some friends, do something that connects you. In the game's stories, many forms of love are connected to rekindling hope in people. So if you're feeling the misery seeping in, if it feels like the candle of hope is flickering and burning away as you go to sleep, Dream not of the darkness that is left, but of love that does not snuff out, a flame that burns brighter in your dreams, making the dark recede, if ever so slowly. Thanks for listening to me ramble about how queer my special interest game is. Reflect love in abundance. You are a guardian. Special thank you to my wonderful patrons. Thank you to my clanmate and friend Nails, my friend Lady Raincloud, and my mum for script feedback, Alicia from Transparency for voicing Ariana 3, Nash Romy for lending his voice, please go look at his comics, they are great, Adequate Emily and David J. Bradley for editing feedback, and Lady Knight the Brave for script and editing feedback. I'll see you next month for something more long form.